In Lutheranism, there's the word and there's the deed. And so there's faith in action that really represents uh, what we are about and how we live out stewardship and the other precepts that are contained in the teachings of Jesus and throughout the Bible. And so in this session, we're going to look at the many ways in which Ken, through various Lutheran organizations, through his interaction with people of other faiths, and through his various churches that he served, uh, how he took faith and made it into action. Okay, we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, faith in action, and, and so I'd really like to go into that a little more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, what are some examples of uh, where, where you, over the course of your career, have really seen um, demonstrations of courage and faith? Uh, in the early part of my ministry, I would have to say every day almost was an illustration of courage and faith, where you met people. For example, I met some of those Lutheran pastors who had every reason to stay back home and stay in their churches and probably wouldn't have been affected too greatly, not as greatly as some of the other persons. But they came and they became refugees, homeless, really. And that takes courage to go to a, a no place. They didn't know where they were, but end up. And I think particularly in that regard to, to the Archbishop of Latvia, this person who played a major role in our life, as you know. Uh, he, no matter what, if he had stayed at home, he probably would have been executed. And that's a choice to make. Do I leave or do I stay home and be killed? Those are the kinds of comments and statements that you'd hear so much of the time. So that it was during that first experience of my ministry but as a student, really, which uh, then I became an active leader in that area of social service on the part of Lutheran World Federation uh, for refugees. I had gone to stay for one year and stayed for four. And after much thought, and thinking, I've come to the conclusion that a reason for staying was to benefit, in a way, from the courage and the faith of these people. They were people who uh, who had throwing everything aside except their own person and their families and so on and had gone on to find a safe place to live. It takes courage. It takes courage on the part of everyone, but it took particular courage on the part of the leaders who could have turned some around and stayed home and waited it out. That wasn't the case. And there, of course, have been other areas of courage. You know, I have been thinking about that congregation, those 20 or so people in Redwood City when I came. It took courage on their part to say, we are going to start a congregation in this city. And to see it take on and on and on and on. 
And it takes courage on the part of those people to see what they hope for come about. So it isn't only overseas and those very dramatic moments of obvious courage. It's also uh, existed on the part of people in new congregations. Uh, I know that I'm speaking about family here, but I think of the courage of Richard and Kathy when they came here, there was a piece of property that had been bought. And several people's ideas that a congregation might exist here. And they took on the task. And pardon me for referring to family. But uh, it took courage to and it took courage for this congregation to be where it is. And every time we receive new people, it's added to that sense of courage that it takes to have a congregation and to build it and then to have it spread out its wings from which the people came to serve. That's courage. Anyone who has listened to your sermons and Richard's sermons and Kathy's sermons over the years know that one of the go-to guys uh, who you often reference is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Oh, yes. What should Lutherans know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I never got to meet him. But I got to meet him in many ways, other than as a living human being. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came from a good family. He had uh, a number of brothers and sisters. His father was a teacher at the Berlin University. His mother was the daughter of a major Lutheran leader in Germany. And they grew up a family that one rarely sees in spite of our educated world. All of them had strong education in the areas they chose to study and to, to become. Dietrich Bonhoeffer decided the only one in the family on theology. He was going to study theology. Now, one would think that because of that, we'd have many records of his sermons, and all of that. But uh, Luther's, I mean, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's first sermon was just as the Nazis were coming into real power in Germany. But he preached his sermon nevertheless. And he was at that point, silenced, no longer allowed to preach publicly in pulpits and so on, any case. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer continued on. He studied, he was put in prison for speaking out too loudly in different places, three different times. And uh, all during all of this time, he kept studying and writing theology. In fact, he became the leader and the 
one of the principal teachers in two underground seminaries that were going on during the war. And those seminaries produced the pastors. They were acknowledged and they were ordained secretly and so on. But he taught the, in these underground seminaries for three different summers. Uh, Eberhard Bethke, we are indebted to him. He was a close friend and associate of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He had been to school with him and so on. And he is the one who then took his experiences with Dietrich and put it all on paper and wrote the books and the stories about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in prison three different times by the Nazis. And uh, each time it was a bit worse. Uh, but he would uh, receive visitors occasionally from his parents. He would receive visitors from a friend, friends of his during that period of time that he was in prison. Uh, however, he didn't quite make it. The war was over, if you remember in April 19, April 23rd, in 19, uh, 45. No, 45. That was the, the end of the war. He was killed, hung, outside of a camp where people went to die, really. Uh, on April the 9th and on April the 23rd, he would have been free after all of this time. And uh, he was uh, denied the opportunity, of course, to be free again. He uh, continued no matter what the result was he continued teaching and preaching, leading these kinds of groups in the summertime, out in the fields, really training for the ministry. And uh, he would write letters to various people. And I don't know if they are all collected today or not. But he would be giving courage to bishops, courage to other other pastors, and so on. Always, uh, always uh, uh, resulting in more suffering on his part until he was hung on April the 9th. On April 23rd, of course, the war was over. Another person who was in the same camp as uh, he was, even the day when he was hung, was uh, Hans Lüge, one of later one of the bishops of Germany and a personal friend from whom I have learned so much. Uh, Hans Lilia was scheduled to die six or eight days after the war ended. They found a, a schedule that they had of just eliminating some of these people whom they had in their prison and killing them. And it was true for Bonhoeffer, it wasn't for Lilia. But Bonhoeffer grew up in this well-educated family, and he showed it all in his theology and in his uh, uh, 
and in the work that he did. Summers teaching underground seminaries. In the winter, uh, sometimes meeting with various families and people. And nevertheless, continuing, no, and if he was in prison, he would receive visitors as long as he could. And he talked to them, never once losing faith. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, it is said to, that we should remember and Luther should know more about Bonhoeffer because of his the strength of his faith and the depth of his faith and the depth of his knowledge. He was a continual student and uh, a resistor of the Nazis. The Lutheran pastors at, at that time, uh, were they offered deals uh, from the Nazis that uh, uh, opportunity to leave, opportunity to recant? Uh, some were, and some accepted those deals. And of course, this was uh, something that was very difficult for Bonhoeffer. Uh, he knew that some were accepting. And... Uh, this was true for uh, the person who has written about him, uh, who is his life, lifetime companion, practically. And, uh, but not Bonhoeffer. And uh, he was given an opportunity. One could sort of read it in the way in which uh, things happened given an opportunity to change his mind, to do things that would have given him freedom to speak, at least for a while. But he never did that. He was in prison most of his life, really. Well, I should say not most of his life, but most of his professional life, what would have been his professional life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's remarkable. Um, uh, someone who is that skilled, someone who is that profoundly faithful, that they are willing to endure what he went through uh, to uh, turn down any uh, opportunities to to back away from his faith. Um, right and. Uh, uh, it, it definitely is a story that should be better known. It should be much better known than it is. I have written, I have read, not the latest volume that has been written by another person on Bonhoeffer, but I have read uh, his close friend's volume on Bonhoeffer. It's a book that is uh, really turns out to be almost a thousand pages or 800 some pages. And it's a thorough story of his life and written by this friend, <clears throat> his friend who served in the service for a while, but they kept in correspondence so that Bonhoeffer was in touch with what was going on in much of the military in Spain and so on. Mm -hmm. Not in Spain, in Italy, when they were fighting there. But uh, he is, uh, in my book, perhaps one of the great saints of this century. Or any century. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, have there been moments where you have just because of things that the, the church has done or because of uh, statements by representatives of church where you just have this feeling, I am really proud to be a Lutheran. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I would have to attribute at least some of those to Franklin Clark Fry, who... Uh, 
was one of the outstanding leaders of the Lutheran Church in my time. He was uh, he was the president of the United Lutheran Church in America. He was a pastor first. At one time when I went into his office when he was president of the church and I was doing some of the work for the whole church, went into his office and said, well, I'd like to go back to the congregation. And he said, Kenny, and that was his term for me, Kenny, so would I. And if I ever get a chance, I will go back to the parish. <laughs> but he was one of the great leaders in my judgment. Not only of the Lutheran church, but in the Christian churches of the world. Because he became one of the major organizers of the World Council of Churches. One of the reasons I say that he is one of the great leaders, and one I am so happy to have known, is he, he was the kind of leader who saw the need for the church to be together. He saw the need for the church to live with each other so that they weren't separate and lose their strength and, and so on. And uh, so he was one of those. Another person was a person where the relationship was more personal, I suppose. And that was uh, a, a friend by the name of Carl Lundquist. Carl Lundquist was a student pastor. That was his first love, and that's where he started, in Minnesota as a pastor of Lutheran students. And of course, he became pastor of more than Lutheran students, if the truth is known, in, uh, in many ways. And he and I became friends when I attended a National Conference of the Lutheran Church. And then when he came to New York, it was necessary because of one of my responsibilities as a ecumenical student worker to be in New York almost every weekend. And I would come up from Gettysburg and then he and I would spend time together. And uh, he is one of those leaders like Franklin Clark Fry, whom I think of as one of the major leaders of the church, and certainly those who have given my life a different look. As you go through that answer, it's interesting how many times you stress unity. Oh, yes. And it's no surprise to anyone that we are living in uh, times of division and times of distraction. Yes. Um, in, in times of uh, uh, really uh, doubt about institutions. And sure. that's, uh, it's uh, almost any institution uh, from government to uh, business uh, to healthcare. And it certainly affects the churches and yes, the rest does. of the churches as well. And um, so based on all your experience, uh, what things must the Lutheran Church do to to meet these challenges that are pulling things apart when our strength has been uh, so long rooted in unity? Well, I think that the Lutheran Church must, first of all, show unity within itself. That uh, there must be that kind of unity it says where some are gathered, others are nearby. And there needs to be more of that kind of unity expressed in local areas and in larger neighborhoods and so on. And I think that the Lutheran Church has been a good example for all church bodies 
at least in one area. And that is, as they have, after there were 16 Lutheran churches in this country, a hundred years ago. Now we are down to maybe two or a few who are outside of the two. And whether or not those two will ever find a relationship, namely our church in Missouri City, is hard to say. There are more difficulties in some areas than in others. But First of all, there must be that kind of, of effort at coming together. Whatever the form may be of the coming together. And uh, the National Council of Churches, which I know is an organization, it's a council, and all of the problems that go with that. But the council does provide an opportunity for us or for at least our leaders in the various churches to come together. One of the uh, things that uh, in my little group of statistics that some of my family have gathered, and I've helped, <laughs> uh, is that uh, I was for 21 years a representative to the National, to the National Council of Churches in the United States on the behalf of our church. And I, uh, I'm grateful for that because Franklin Clark Fry, whom I've always considered a leader of different proportions from all of us, was also a representative to the National Council of Churches for 21 years. So that we were the same uh, number of years. But I think that that is necessary if we are going to hold together the body of Christian life in the United States. That we need to be together more than we are, even at the present time. We have a lot to learn. And that expression hasn't taken hold locally as much as I wish it had, where we would find ourselves working together. But usually people in a congregation such as this one are uh, so involved in the life of the congregation, this congregation, that it's very difficult to give much time elsewhere, but a few of us can, and we need to do that whenever we can. So people have a different understanding of what stewardship means, and, and stewardship is one of the principles that mm -hmm. the, our church is very committed to. Um, it's a principle that arises out of the biblical teachings, sure. um, uh, deeply, deeply rooted in, in the Bible. Um, and, and so, um, what, um, how do members of the clergy effectively and practically involve themselves in the uh, uh, community uh, affairs and the community debates in the political arena? Uh, you've asked a difficult question. Because uh, all of us, I think when I say us, I'm talking about the clergy, especially. <clears throat> all of us uh, uh, may want to be involved. But we know that uh, our there are all kinds of allegiances and understandings of where we stand. Uh, with uh, government and with uh, uh, groups within the community or the society so that it's very difficult for pastors to give themselves totally to 
those kinds of endeavors because of the uh, concerns of people in the congregation and, and uh, their allegiances and to other people as well. And so it becomes more difficult for pastors. But I believe, but I, not all clergy agree with me on this. I believe that it is important for us to show some kind of understanding with, and life with other groups. And uh, some of that is uh, it, having exchanges with government. Uh, but we need to know what our role is. It is not to govern government. It is rather to perhaps to give ideas, to give suggestions, uh, but uh, also with the understanding that there may be people in the congregation who are opposed to those kinds of judgments, uh, those kinds of suggestions uh, that we may be suggesting uh, and giving to uh, public uh, people in the public arena. But I do believe that there is a modest way in which we can have exchanges because those exchanges can also be refreshing. They can be refreshing for a body such as this church they can be refreshing for people in government to have people with uh, who approach community in slightly different ways, and certainly for for the different goals, and uh, and the, the reason. So I think that uh, we need to have perhaps a little more interrelationship than we have. I realize that I'm on the edge of that group. <laughs> well, for members of congregations, uh, we, we hear, go forth, spread the word. That's right. And a lot of people say, okay, how, where, mm -hmm. how, how, do, how, how do we constructively and productively do that? That's right. Well, uh, I, I think that... Uh, uh, we can constructively do that by becoming involved in other groups in the community that aren't the church, but they are uh, perhaps political associations. And while we may not be able to direct that political association, we can certainly give some uh, uh, we, we can certainly give uh, uh, ideas and, uh, and uh, thoughts and, uh, to groups like that and to other groups in the community as well. The, um, we've talked a little bit about the uh, Lutheran advocacy industry, but uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, here is, here's the voice of the, uh, uh, Lutheran Church, in, in some respects, in, engaging uh, with members of other faith, um, espousing principles that our church holds very dear, uh, and and everything. Um, but it seems such a small portion of the Lutheran effort over overall. Um, is it something that uh, really we ought to be paying more attention to, committing more resource to? I think we ought to be committing more resource to it. And I think we ought to be doing that in several ways. <clears throat> I think it would be very important for the Lutheran Church as a synod or as a church body to be more active in groups that may be semi-political, but relationship groups, people who who become a part of the group because they feel they have something that they can contribute 
and they do contribute uh, in in that way. And uh, I I think that that becomes uh, very important. However, we sit back because maybe the pastor is giving leadership in that area. And a pastor can't give total leadership in every area. And in some areas, other people can take that leadership and gather people uh, with one another so that a contribution can be made to the total group. And the result is that uh, advocacy groups before government would have much more influence if the group were larger. You mentioned the smallness of the effort at times. And these groups need to be larger because, uh, and a pastor, obviously, I needn't say this, must be very careful because in this congregation, there are many groups. There are, are not many groups necessarily, but people who, who would give adherence to different kinds of groups. And uh, sometimes those groups can function together. Sometimes they must function separately. Well, you talked about what a learning exercise your time in Europe uh, was, but yeah. especially your time in, in Germany and, and uh, how that influenced uh, really uh, your, your approach to things and, and your, your, your life. And uh, we seem to be at a time where people are, again, looking to be more insular. Uh, that uh, well, why, why are we doing things in other places when we have so many problems here at home? Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I, I think the question is, um, how important is it for the Lutheran Church to maintain its place as part of a world community, um, not just the Lutheran Church of America. Mm -hmm. Very important. In fact, uh, I still consider the most important large conference I ever attended was one I wasn't a delegate, but it was the first Lutheran World Federation gathering. Because that was the first time Lutheran churches from the corners of the world came together and said, we are one organization. And when the Lutheran World Federation speaks, it speaks for all of us. And we have had times when that has happened. And it's been a wonderful experience for those of us who I may known about it and so on. But uh, it's also, uh, I think, necessary for groups in congregations to uh, express themselves in such a way, not that they want to take over other groups, but speak with other groups. Individual groups and congregations speaking with other individual groups in, in other congregations. For example, uh, one of the things that uh, you know, I, I still hope for, and it's partially there, the, the Lutheran's involvement in, uh, in government. No, we can't run government. We can't even advise government as such. But we can have people in different congregations who are interested, who are wanting to do something in relation to government. And uh, to do that, it requires uh, some effort on the part of groups in this congregation and in some other congregations to come together. I think that uh, that is necessary. 
I think that congregations have been wanting and willing to be separated. I suppose the first thing is that uh, there is a fear that one congregation will take other congregations' members. I'm not thinking about that at all. But I think rather than simply having congregations come together at certain great, large events, how good it would be for two or three small groups from this congregation to meet now and then with groups in the other congregations, Lutheran congregations in this area. And also possibly with other Protestant denominations uh, groups, or even Roman Catholic, depending upon what the issue is. And I think that that kind of relationship among the churches is extremely important. Uh, several weeks ago, our uh, pastoral intern uh, described for us the uh, time he spent in Argentina and Uruguay. Um, the idea to most people that there are Lutherans in Argentina and Uruguay and that Lutheran services are held in Spanish yeah. uh, comes as a huge surprise to, yes. to people. But uh, um, I, I guess it's, a, it's an indication of around the globe. Um, there are pockets of, of Lutherans and... Uh, they're, they're all part of the Lutheran community, and so we should be we should be reaching out and helping sustain them the same way we do our neighbors. That's right. This is uh, what I meant a little while ago when I said groups from different congregations should be visiting, but other uh, groups in, in congregations. <laughs> this was made possible worldwide when the Lutheran World Federation was formed. You're seeing the results in this young man being able to go to another country and visit with people of the Christian faith there. His, his ministry is going to be altogether different than if he had never gone. There are other things that improve ministry. That is the only thing. But uh, 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 certainly that will enhance his ministry. The, the, the group coming together, the larger group, the Lutheran World Federation, makes that possible because we get to know these other Lutheran churches. We have, or at least uh, know that was the church, where was it? It has a relationship with the church, one of the congregations in Africa, I forget. Oh, our tech for Tanzania, the, the, right. the, the Kondi uh, diocese. That's right, yeah. that's right. So one of, one of the things that we've uh, had in this congregation, which we've strongly supported, is that uh, we have a relationship with the Kondi diocese in Tanzania. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we have a discrete program uh, called Tech for Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, providing uh, computer equipment and, and capacity uh, for a university, the Lutheran okay. University in, in Tanzania. Good. Uh, Good. So uh, you Good. know this. This I think is uh, living out the kind of thing that you're describing. That's right. That's right. Because that kind of thing not only brings a relationship to, but it provides fodder for a relationship of more than that, more than just uh, uh, these two institutions, because other people not only hear about that, but other people follow suit. That kind of thing is going on in many places today. Con people uh, from one congregation are sending people to another. For example, uh, I think it was the uh, the congregation in Gettysburg 
was uh, sending people to Africa, a, gr a group of people to a, to a ministry there. Uh, but they had a relationship because of, of inner relationships with the, with the World Federation. Uh, well, a lot of years ago, we took in some of the Lost Boys from Sudan. Right. And now, on Sundays, we have Sudanese church services in, right. in the afternoon being held here at Tree of Life. Um, so in, a, in another way, uh, we've, we've made a very strong connection uh, right. with, with Africa. I'm very happy about that because uh, I was here for about three months when Kathy and Richard were on me on a leave for a period of time, they went west to the west coast and so on. And I served in the congregation that uh, three months period. The Sudanese boys came during that period. <laughs> and I, I remember going to the airport and waiting there until about one o'clock until a plane came in <laughs> to, uh, to help them get to their various places, you know, up to the house upstairs, up behind the church. Uh -huh. Well, in, in terms of connection, um, uh, our, our greatest effort is uh, now what's called Tree for Hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it started it started with mission trips, but now it's, it's grown into much, much more mm -hmm. than that. Um, and uh, did, did you have a role in having Tree for Hope get underway? Yes, I did. Uh, I participated, but I can't take any credit of any kind. I participated in the first several meetings of uh, the group that finally went to uh, Guatemala. And, uh, but I never went or participated in such direct ways. But I helped in the idea of finding a group in Guatemala that could be related to. And uh, instead, they've decided to build that group, right? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, they were they were doing work with uh, orphanages and that, uh, but uh, there's now a uh, group of girls and, and they were, uh, they they were always denied spots in the schools because uh -huh. there, there there weren't enough spots in the schools and the boys were the first ones in and uh, so there's uh, the school been constructed uh, and is uh, just recently started operating and it's a school for girls yes it's a tremendous thing because uh, what will happen there in that part of the world will be that girls will have opportunities in positions and places of work and, and service that they never would have had if they hadn't had this opportunity in a school. 